Welcome to the Animals Television Show everyone. I'm your host Romy Bueller. Thank you again for joining me. We have a slightly different show for you today as some of our guests have had to reschedule. So I thought I'd take this opportunity to talk to you more about animal communication and how incredibly useful this is to care for an animal in the best possible way. And I'm not just talking your cat or dog, I'm talking all animals. So if you have pets under your care or you're working in a rescue center or a sanctuary or a zoo, you can communicate with all animals. Have you thought of the number of questions that have come up for you over the time that you've been living with or caring for animals? There's, they're all day, every day. I know that myself. And I have to say, I'm also very guilty of not knowing how to care for animals. I've had cats and dogs and fish throughout my entire life and I'm guilty of not being able to care for them in a way that they need. And perhaps this is where my passion has come from because I've seen how wrong I got it. And now that I can talk to them and know exactly what they need, I know how to care for them better in conjunction with good um, holistic vet care and those types of things. I can tell you, it takes the guilt out of looking after an animal. You know that time where your cat or dog is about to pass and you don't know whether they're in pain, you don't know what they need, you don't know whether they want some help to be put to sleep or whether they want to pass by themselves, whether now is the time. You can ask those questions because I know they're the ones that we feel really guilty about because when, when they pass, you think, could I have done more? Should I have seen something, you know, two years beforehand or something like that? Should I have done something else? I'm not suggesting for a moment either that you don't love your animals. I know that you do. Well, for the most part anyway. The people that don't probably aren't watching this show right now. But you love your animals, but that doesn't necessarily equate to the best possible care. How do we know how to care for our animals in the best possible way? Well, we need to be educated. We need to learn how to do that from the people that know, hence the show. We need to learn and experience and keep learning because things change all of the time. We need to be really in tune with our animals. We need to observe them. We need to know them better than we do and all of those types of things. Now, we all have this innate ability to communicate with each other between species with animals through telepathy. Now I know people hear that word and I think, oh, woo woo, fortune tellers, crystal balls and all those types of things. I'd like to take the woo woo out of this conversation because it just doesn't help anyone. Not when there is a solution to some of the problems that we're all experiencing out there. The solution is asking your animal a question, receiving an answer and then doing something with the information, which is better than guessing because guessing 50-50 chance we'll get it right, 50-50 chance we won't. So what is animal communication? 
Animal communication is where we're able to get the why. Something that happened with me many years ago was I had two cats. Uh, I still have one of them now. The other one has passed. I had two cats, brother and sister. Now, all of a sudden, out of the blue, she started weeing around her food bowl on the wall. And I thought this was very unusual. So unusual new behaviors from an animal are trying to tell you something. She was trying to tell me something. Something wasn't right. Now, if I wasn't able to communicate with her or her brother, who was the problem child, if I wasn't able to communicate with them, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have had a clue what to do actually. So I asked her, why are you doing that? What's going on? And what was happening was her brother, who was quite a lot bigger than her, was bullying her, or not really bullying her, but he was roughing her up with play when we weren't home. Now he did a little bit of that when we were home, but it wasn't to the degree that it was happening while we were out of the house. And he was dive bombing her and he was charging her and he was you know, chasing around the house and sort of pushing her into walls and things like that. And it was scaring her and it was hurting her. So I got the information, why are you weighing around your bowl on the wall? Because you know none of us want to be cleaning up cat's pee all the time. I got the information and then I was able to have a conversation with him to say, pull your head in buddy, this is not on, this is unacceptable behavior. Do you realize that you're hurting her? And do you realize that this is scaring her? And it actually wasn't, he was just playing because that's what cats do, they love to play. He was playing with her, not realizing that he's much bigger and stronger than her and that he was hurting her. And because she was kind of running away and chasing uh, as well, he thought she was engaged in that play. It stopped immediately. That behavior stopped straight away because he stopped that behavior. It's not always that easy, but you know, you can certainly get the why. We communicate through this silent language. And yes, it's called telepathy. And no, it's not woo woo because we are born with this. This is an innate, ability this is our natural state of being that we just need to draw out of the archives it is where we send images from one to the other we send feelings we send thoughts taste smell this strong sense of knowing you probably have all heard the word clairvoyance it has that bit of stigma attached to it as well yes unfortunately but clair just means clear and voyance vision, so clear vision. Now clairvoyance is where we see images in our mind. So we might see a still image, we might see a running video or movie screen. Now if you were to say ask your animal, what is your favorite food? They might show you in an image, bacon, spaghetti bolognese, sardines, meat, whatever their favorite food is. And it's not always what you think it might be. So you can play around with these things by sort of impressing an image over to them and say out loud or send the words over to them, show me your favorite food in a way that I can see. Not all of us are very strong with clairvoyance. So it might be that you taste the food or you smell it or you just know what it is. So we have these other senses clear audience, which is clear hearing. We have clear cognizance, which is a sense of knowing, a very strong sense of knowing. And I had another occasion with this when we were selling a house um, many years ago, and I knew we'd have one home open. I knew the first person that walked in there that would buy it, and I knew it would be sold within a couple of weeks. I just knew it's a strong sense of knowing, and that's exactly how it played out. All of you would have experienced this, the strong sense of knowing, the strong sense of right or wrong, or that someone's lying to you, or something's not right. That's claircognizance. Clairaudience is clear hearing. It's fairly self-explanatory. This is where you may hear a word, a sentence, or even a paragraph in your mind. Some of us hear outside as well, but it's a small percentage. So most of us hear in our mind, and it sort of looks like thoughts. Uh, so it can be a little bit confusing because you just think you're thinking where it might actually be information coming through for you. And some of you may have heard those stories in emergencies where someone's driving along, they're coming through to a, a green or a red light, their light is green and all of a sudden they just hear this stop in their mind. And so they slam on the brakes and someone's coming through a red light. 
and it would have cleaned them up and killed them. So it can work a lot in emergencies. I know there's a friend of mine who, and this is a really good one, um, she always knows where the police are because she gets information beforehand. There's a speed camera, there's a radar, there's a police car coming up, slow down. So that's always a useful one. It can be a really difficult one to trust because it does look like our thoughts. And I'll give you an example of one of my occasions with this as I started to learn more and more how my clear hearing looked for me. I was going to a meditation session one night and it was in the bush and I got there during the day and I parked up next to this little tree and I thought to myself, it would be so easy to reverse into that tree, it's right in my blind spot. And I looked over to the side and I thought, oh, maybe I'll go and park over there. And for whatever reason, I didn't do that. And so I've come out fully meditated at nine o'clock at night. I reverse out and bang, there she goes. I've reversed straight into this tree. And I had to laugh. I mean, it was a mess, cost me a bit, but I had to laugh because I actually got that information as I was parking up. Clairsentience is another sense and it is where we sense through feeling. And a lot of you that have been told you're overly sensitive or too sensitive growing up, um, you're probably very good at this one. This is our gut feeling and it's very strong in a lot of us and it's where we can sense too from an animal's perspective or a person, we can sense someone's personality or their essence. It's one that I'm very strong at as I do the medical intuition and also the missing animals and I feel on behalf of an animal how they're feeling physically, mentally, emotionally for whatever the situation is. Now there are a couple of senses that we don't tend to work with too much knowingly, although we're probably still very strong at that too for some of us. And it's the, the sense of smell and taste. The taste sense, it's like you're tasting something in your mouth but you don't actually have anything in your mouth. If you can imagine sucking on a lemon, do you taste that in your mouth? Where do you taste it in your mouth and what does it taste like? Or a um, piece of chocolate or a cup of coffee or something like that. Now the other sense is our sense of smell, clear smelling or clear aliens. This is where we receive impressions through smell or scent. And some of you may have found that you smell, you know, grandma, that, that familiar perfume, or there's a flower or cigar smoke or a pipe smell of your old grandparent or friend that you used to know that used to smoke. You can smell without the actual smell being there, the burning smoke or the perfume. Smell and taste is really good if you're interested in forensics and those types of things because you can taste chemicals and smell chemicals and taste blood and, and you know smell fires and, and those types of things so it can be really helpful with more that um, intuitive detective work. They are the senses that are available to all of us and to different degrees for everybody. We all work differently, we all have our strengths and our weaknesses. Maybe some of us are very strong in the seeing and the hearing, but not so much in the feeling or vice versa, or maybe we're good at all of them. Um, you know, it starts with being aware that it is a thing, that we can do this, and then having the belief and the trust that you can, starting to practice and learning how to do it. I'm gonna take you now into some of my case studies, some clients that I've had and how it looked like for me. So you can see how it might also look like for you because you can start practicing this now. You can go away and start to have a bit of a play. What you might find too is that you've seen, heard, felt, smelt, tasted or known some of these things before with your own animals. And this is what happened to me. When I really started to get into this work and learn more about it, I have seen all these things before. I just didn't know how it looked for me. I want to talk to you first up about this horse by the name of Spike. He was a great horse, but he'd had a massive accident where he'd slipped in the mud and done a split basically through the back legs and suffered some lower back problems. So he couldn't be ridden. He was being rested and treated and all the right things. And mum wanted to have a chat to him to see where he was at. This is quite some time. There was a lengthy process getting him back to good health. What he showed me, so I see this through vision, the images in my mind. I see him running around barrels, like 44 gallon drum barrels. I hear, I'm agile. Just those words, I'm agile. Which made sense because he was very agile running around these barrels. 
I felt in my own body on his behalf, I felt really strong in my stance, like my legs felt really strong and muscular. And my whole back end, my hips, my legs, my lower back, they just felt really strong and connected to the front end of the body. I also kept hearing, please, please, please give me something to do. I'm bored now. Then I felt this feeling of readiness and energy, like he was full of energy bouncing off the walls. So that was Spike. Now this little guy's name is Gus. He's pretty cute, isn't he? Now he was having a few little behavioral issues. He was off the Richter with his energy. He was jumping all over people and he was howling and he was just doing all sorts of really irritating things for dad. So he wanted to have a look and see what was going on with him. What the first thing that came to me was this high pitched sound in my head of tools like drills and um, drop saws and things like that. And it was just high pitched and screechy in my ears and it was so uncomfortable. I just didn't like it. I wanted to get away from it. I also felt this severe pain in my head. So I'm hearing and feeling at the same time. I also hear the word rosemary and I know that that is a herb because I'm showing the plant, the rosemary bush. So then I want to investigate nutrition and I'm not going to go into the whole conversation and the whole viewing of Gus, but basically the um, food that he was being fed, which was dried biscuits had or kibble, it had rosemary extract in it and it was really affecting him and his... Um, behavior. Dad was also a carpenter so he was using really noisy and screechy and loud tools for his work. The next horse I have here his name is Ranger. He's an absolutely classic horse. He's a Mustang. He was kept in captivity for a while before he was bought by a fantastic lady up there in Minnesota and she was having trouble in general with him but particularly catching him. And so when I first connected in with Ranger, I had this feeling, just this feeling within me that he's very arrogant and he's very confident and he's very sure of himself. I also get this feeling of frustration towards humans and I hear the words, he thinks they're stupid, thinks humans are stupid. I see in my vision another horse and I see him shouldering her out of the way. I know this horse is a female and I know that he doesn't like her. I feel it, I know it, and I see it. Um, and I see him pushing her out of the way. All of this information I got validated by his mum, his human mum. She just laughed because it summed him up perfectly. I also see in my vision, and I know that he has a sharp focus and eye for detail. And I see him watching the other horses with a whole lot of focus, watching what they're doing, watching the people that are training those horses, he's watching them. And he tells me through words that he would be a great coach and he would do a better job than the humans. And he's perhaps right. What we needed to show his mum with this one was how to communicate with him the best way for her to catch him to start with. I've spoken about this in previous shows because it comes up all of the time. Because animals do see the images in your mind, we are often showing them how not to do something. So she was getting really frustrated every day that she couldn't catch this horse. So she had this image in her mind of it all going wrong, that he was going to run away from her, that he was going to be a bit of a brat and that she was going to chase him and that this was going to happen. It unfolded perfectly. So when she got to him to go and try and catch him, she had that video screen of how hard it was going to be and how it was going to look. And that's exactly how it looked, exactly how she showed him and what was going on in her mind. That's how it looked. So I told her to change her vision and to really impress it over to, to him on how she wanted it to look. So she created this video screen of exactly how she wanted it to look. And that's exactly how it played out. And the, the funny thing was, she sent me a message to say that everybody um, in the barn was watching her. 
So they were watching and they were just flabbergasted that she was able to so easily hook him up this particular day. And it's been going pretty well since from all accounts. The last one I want to talk to you about is Indy. Now this one was also very funny in a whole different way. I connect him with Indy. Indy's having a few troubles. Is being a little bit of a difficult cat and uh, not eating and those types of things. What I first was shown, and this is through vision, is I see Indy walk towards me, turn around and show me his butthole, which is exactly not the vision that I wanted, whether it's in my imagination or whether it's in my intuition. I didn't want to see it, but it was pretty funny. I got a feeling with that. While I'm seeing his bum, I'm feeling irritated and frustrated and angry. Then we need to know why, because this is the problem. He's sort of being a problem for his parents, his human parents, and he's having eating problems. And why is that? Well, the reason was he was feeling left out. He was not getting any attention and it was really annoying him. And he tells me that he was shitty. So I got those words, I'm shitty. And he showed me that by showing me his bum which is all very interesting. See, this is how it works. It's kind of funny. And that's exactly what it was. When we spoke to mum, uh, she knew exactly what was going on because he'd had free reign. He'd had all the attention in the house and then they'd bought a dog two years beforehand and the dog pretty much got all of the attention and Indy got none. And so they were able to change that. They fixed all of the problems because they gave Indy some attention. Sometimes that's all it is. Just pay attention to how much attention you're giving your animals when you've got more than one in the house. I also just want to finish off today with a little story about my cat Jack, the one that was bullying his sister. Now he passed of kidney cancer last year. It was very, very sad as it always is. But what I was able to do with him, because he started to get sick and then he got really, really sick. And so I was able to every single day and throughout the day ask him, what do you need from me? Do you need food? Do you need water? Where do you want to sit? Because it got to the point where he couldn't walk up the stairs and he couldn't move. So I needed to pick him up and put him somewhere. Um, I needed to pick him up and put him in his litter tray and those types of things. I needed to pick him up and walk him over to the water bowl because he had kidney problems. He was very thirsty all of the time and he couldn't walk to the water. So we were able to have these conversations. He told me where he wanted us to bury him in the garden and that he didn't want to be cremated. He wanted to come back home. He also told me when he wanted to pass and it was very definite, now is the time. I know these times can make us feel very guilty, but I don't feel any guilt at all that I could have done better, that I should have done more for him because I did exactly what he asked me to. From the beginning to the end, I was able to give him exactly what he needed and to care for him by his instruction. And that I guess is my point, is that we can look after our animals based on what they want. Now I have an online animal communication course. It's a foundation course, so it's entry level. And this is for everybody and anyone that is interested to learn more about how to communicate with animals. It takes you step by step on how to do this, what to look for, you know, what your blocks might be. I give you a six step process on how to work through. So when you start to have difficulties, you can go back and just step it out. It's really good to have some structure to start with. And then once you know what you're doing and how it looks like for you, then you just go and you go and do your own thing in your own style and you'll find your own way. Thank you for watching this segment of the show, everyone. I can't stress enough how useful it is to really be able to have a conversation with your animals, to understand why the strange behavior, why aren't they eating? Why do they feel sick? Where do they feel sick? Where is the injury? What does the injury feel like? Why are they anxious? What makes them anxious? Where's the fear coming from? Why are they leash aggressive? Why are they angry? Why, 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 why? There are so many questions that you can ask an animal and get an answer to. We are going to have the chat box now. This is where I talk to the goldfish and the wild goats, the mountain goats, the tree goats. So we are talking to the collective consciousness, if you like, of those animals or those species. And you do this in exactly the same way as you do for your cat, your dog, your horse, or the tiger at the zoo up the road. Thank you for watching this segment. We're going to jump over now into the chat box.
chat box, everyone. I am looking forward to this segment. We missed it in the last episode. So tonight we have two animals coming up for a chat. This week, we are specifically talking to wild goats and goldfish. And this is where we're going to start. We're starting with the goldfish. And while I wasn't specifically asking for the goldfish that was trapped in a glass bowl, this is the goldfish that wanted to chat with us, which makes perfect sense as we get into it. Now, our viewer question was this. Do they really have a three second memory? They didn't really see the purpose of asking that question actually, but they obliged with an answer. And this is what they said. Call it whatever you like. We live by sense. And if you want to give that a label, then call it memory. It's of no relevance to us how you use your language. I suggested that they may need to remember where to go for safety. And this is when I knew that I'd invited in the pet goldfish because the answer to that was no, we're in glass bowls, not oceans. I asked how they felt about that and was told in a very matter of fact and blunt manner, it is the slowest form of torture on the planet. Doesn't that make you feel good? Anyone out there have a goldfish on their kitchen bench or in their kid's bedroom? Nothing is meant to be held captive for your pleasure, particularly when we're mostly forgotten, unfed and left to die. Plastic plants and colourful stones that give off what they called water fumes should not exist. We are not toys. We are not a child's pleasure or teaching tool to learn how to care for something. We are often kept alone and without company and that is another torture. We like being with other goldfish. The bowls are suffocating. We are often kept in the dark and which causes problems with sight and a sensitivity when the lights go on and off. Now, when I communicate with an animal, I'll often be shown in my body how that feels for them. So with this, I felt an uncomfortable stinging sensation in my eyes that I couldn't shake off and I couldn't get away from it. And this is how it feels for them. They also show me the water is too hot and my entire body feels extremely hot, but particularly in my head, which is quite unbearable. It was a quick chat and I finished off by asking them what they'd like us humans to know. And I was very bluntly told that humans don't know how to look after us, so they shouldn't. We are not your trial and error. If you want to look at something pleasurable, go outside and look at a natural vista. I couldn't agree more actually. His parting words were, we would rather die than live unethically in captivity. I would have to agree. Living in captivity or an unnatural environment for anyone would be a long and painful death. So jumping into our goats now, well, maybe not literally, but we're going to have a chat to them. I'm particularly talking wild goats and mountain goats and the tree goats. One of our viewers sent me an article a couple of weeks ago wondering how and why on earth these goats would want to wander so precariously on the edge of rock walls and cliff faces and the goats that um, eat the argan fruit in the tops of trees, which is just really bizarre. When I asked for a spokes goat to come through for a chat, they wanted to send me two, one for the mountain goats and one for the tree goats. So we'll split them up. Unlike the goldfish, the goats felt really caring towards our ignorance. The goldfish felt just a little bit more frustrated, I think. The goats think we are far too logical, particularly with what we think is right and wrong and normal or unusual. And this is what they had to say about wandering right on the edge of these cliff faces. This is all we have ever known and it is very natural to us. This defies logic to you. You lack trust in things that don't make sense to you. We are purpose built for this terrain. I asked them, are you looking for anything specific when you're skirting the rock edges? And I have seen videos many years ago of these goats and they're licking the rocks. And to me, I was assuming that that was probably um, licking nutrients. So I was interested to hear what they had to say about that. So I asked him, you know, what are you doing when you're skirting the edges? And he says, yes, they're looking for the sweet spot. And they sniff that sweet spot out and when they hit it, there's such a distinct smell and it's warm and dense and salty. They also show me this in taste where the regular wall tastes of not much, a bit dusty, sandy, but the sweet spot is super salty. I ask what these nutrients do to their body that they're licking off the wall and I hear that it enriches their blood and it strengthens their heart. Now to the question of how they walk on the walls, with what looks like little to no space or grip. I'm shown in a more physical way 
a sense of being drawn into the wall, like I'm leaning in, but I'm not really leaning in or on the wall as such. They're very balanced and steady. Their hooves grab onto the rocks like really strong fingers. Like I just, in the center of their hoof, it's like they just kind of grip on. Um, I ask them if they ever fall, to which they respond, of course, that is the true course of nature. Many of us fall, but the majority of us don't. I'm shown then a neurological disease that um, affects their eyesight and their judgment and their balance. Now this is something that leeches from the rocks and that it is very addictive. And to them in small doses it's fine, but in large doses it can cause this problem. All par for the course I feel, they seem really practical with what goes on for them. Now for the tree goats, which just messes with my logical head. I'll drop some photos here so you can see what I'm talking about. but. It's actually pretty cool. What I found out after I chatted with these tree goats was that they are getting into these trees for the argan, the, well, the argan trees and they're getting into the trees for the fruit. Now I have a, a black and white kid goat with me and he just bounces up this tree like it's nothing with pure ease and it's the most natural thing in the world for them to do. They're so light. I ask how they stay up there and again, I'm showing the answer to this by way of feeling it myself. And I know that might be hard to get your head around, but if you can imagine yourself water skiing and the strength you might feel in your legs and your arms as you're trying to get out of the water and then the lightness once you're up and that exhilaration, it's those feelings of strength and lightness and ease that you feel in your body. Not that water skiing is easy, mind you, but if you can imagine that, it's the same kind of thing. I'm just feeling that on behalf of an animal. With this, I'm basically the goat in the tree and I feel this perfect balance and strength in both their hooves and their legs. They're locked onto those branches like a quad lock, if any of you know what that is. It's a super strong mounting system for your mobile phones that go on your bikes or your car or scooters. I asked them why they go up there and their response is very short why not? Then I ask them, isn't there food on the ground? Yes. Kid a few words here. And it's like, well, why not just eat that? It would be much easier. And, and he says to me, only to you. He's so unconcerned about it. And, and again, it just seems like the most natural thing for them to do. When I ask the wild goat fraternity if they have a message for us, the wild goats and the tree goats, they say, dream the impossible. Don't be led by logic. It'll get you nowhere. Good words from our goats today, don't you think? Now, if there was anything you wanted to ask an animal like this, let me know and I will get the lowdown from them for you. That's the end of our show for tonight. As always, it's been a great pleasure to have you here. Please jump on and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Click the bell so you get notified of new shows coming up and follow all the pages, share it around with your animal loving family and friends. That would be great if you did that. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. I'm Romy Bueller. Thank you again for watching. We'll see you then.